Hello and welcome to the Embassy. My name is Dr. J.C. Matthews and I'm here with my wife and co-pastor Gina Matthews. And we want to invite you to a brand new series or a study that we're going to be doing that I think uh, is very important to uh, what we do uh, in, in, you know, in life and not only uh, on behalf of you know, our belief, what we believe and being a believer and being part of the church, but uh, more so this revelation I think has been lost to many people in regards to a lot of different endeavors or uh, activities that they put their hands to. Uh, many people start out very uh, passionate, very enthusiastic. They put a lot of energy and a lot of work in what they do. But then oftentimes what's left out is reaping the harvest. That's right. Of what it is that they have been sowing for. So what we're going to do, we're going to start a series entitled The Law of Reaping. The Law of Reaping. There's a revelation that we find uh, in the Bible concerning the responsibility. Yes. That's what I'm going to qualify it is. It's it's a responsibility that every believer has in their um, partnership with God mm -hmm. in recovering what it is that he has provided for a greater purpose. Uh, I think that having the mentality that we are to sow and we are to pray and we are to operate a certain way, that the way that the church has taught people for so long is a very... Um, it cuts off the power to be able to do and to manifest because you're not fulfilling the whole thing. You're not finishing what you started. And I think most of um, that misunderstanding is a result of how we've been taught, yes. um, especially within the church. Um, we, we've been very, uh, we've been inundated with teaching on sowing. Yes. And so many people have a great revelation of the necessity of sowing, um, the different ways of sowing, how to sow, um, but there's been very little instruction on how do you reap That's right. what you sow. So what happens is that we have habitual sowers, we have professional sowers, mm -hmm. and they sow, 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 sow. And, you know, God is faithful in the sense that there are laws already in effect that will cause what you have need of to be provided. Mm -hmm. But sowing in any seed that you sow has as a law a corresponding increase. That's right. You know, no farmer goes out and sows seed for the sole purpose of getting back a seed. That's right. We have to have greater expectation. I think that's another thing that has been lacking in the body of Christ. Our expectation is not what it should be because if it was, we wouldn't deal with some of the things that we're dealing with. And, and so what, what we see now because of that lack of expectation, uh, many people in many instances sow and never go back to right. harvest or to reap what it is that they've sown for. And they, they've got it in their mind because we've been taught so well on sowing mm -hmm. that that's my job. I'm to sow, I'm to sow, I'm to sow. And true enough, God provides seed for the sower. But there is a glory or an administration that we have to take into consideration that that sowing is supposed to uh, is supposed to produce a greater harvest that is supposed to rebound back into that individual lives or that individual sower's life and then other people's lives mm -hmm. and then into the kingdom and then into the world that allows the work of God to be to be performed. And so I think a lot of it is a result of our perception of what it is that we become part of. Yes. And, you know, this 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 is one thing that this ministry has has over the years tried to communicate and tried to uh, bring believers to a conviction of that they became part of a kingdom. Right. Which is an economy. You know, if you look at the word kingdom or how God talks about his household, um, his family in the New Testament, Ephesians, and in Galatians, he talks about the household of God or the household of faith. He's talking about the kingdom of God. That word comes from the word oikios, which is, it, it means to have an economy. It's a household economy. And that's quite different from, you, you know, you believing that you're part of a religion and you yes. have a belief system. Yes, that I believe that religious mentality has um, caused people to live in poverty when they're not supposed to, it, it is diametrically opposed to kingdom thinking where it is an economy and that you are supposed to increase, you are supposed to manifest. Yeah, and most of the parables, if you look at how Jesus um, 
talked about the responsibility, the reciprocal responsibility of the believer in the parables of the talent or the mina, he there, there was an expectation of increase. Yes. You know, he gave a certain amount, but when he came back, he was looking for increase on what he gave. That's right. And even within those parables, there are certain laws that we'll talk about mm -hmm. that um, if you don't recognize these laws and if we... And, if we embrace what we are part of as simply a belief system or a religion that gives us a ticket to go to heaven mm -hmm. where we will see the benefits there, uh, we will forfeit our right, That's right of greater receiving and participation in what God wants to do here simply because we will not have the means to do it. Mm -hmm. Not because God hasn't provided it, That's right. but because our expectations were so low because of our um, our concept of what we're part of yes. you know we're part of a religion we're saved from um hell. hell and we get to go to heaven well you got the rest of your life to live that's right god left us here for a reason and there's people that need our help that's right and they need more than a sermon so there has to be some work that god has left us here for that if we don't if if, if we don't recognize that there's a greater need for mm -hmm. the things of this world, the That's tangible right. things that God has a a role in a a work that He wants done in this world, then we uh, frustrate His ability right. to do what it is that uh, He wants to do in the earth, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, for the rest of the program. Is really get into um, teaching on there are laws that He's put in place mm -hmm. that actually limit what God can do without the participation of a human being. And again, we're talking about the law of reaping. Yes. You know, there there is a law of sowing that we're responsible for, but then there's a corresponding work or responsibility that we have to be cognizant of in order for us to fully participate. Right. So what I want to do is I want to point your attention to some things that I want to, first of all, I want to point you to the scripture and then once we point you to the scripture, I want you to really start to internalize. Now, put aside any uh, religious uh, understanding or spiritualization of the text. This text is literally being given to us That's right. for a purpose for us right here, right now in this life. So I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Now, we start out many times talking about... Um, uh, Deuteronomy 29 and 29 right. and Deuteronomy 29 and 29. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to turn to it. I'm going to quote it, but I want you to write the scripture down. It simply says that the secret things, they belong to the Lord, but those things that he has revealed, they belong to us and to our children so that we may keep his law or, or keep his covenant. And so what we find out is, is that if God reveals something to us mm -hmm. that we otherwise would have no ability in the natural to find out or we have no ability to know for ourselves, no matter what we do, if God reveals those things to us, then he did it on purpose. That's right. And he intends for us to know it because we need to know it. That's right. So when you look at Genesis chapter one, the majority of it, there was no man in existence. So God goes through some very specific things and he's very specific in how he does certain things. He has Moses write these things down. He opens up time, has Moses write these things down, being led by the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit dictating or telling him what to write down. And so we have to understand that what he is revealing to Moses must be important for us to know That's because right. we have no other way of knowing it. That's right. And so now we get to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Now keep in mind, man has not been created yet. Mm -hmm. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, could you, read, could you read that for us? Yes. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. You want me to go to 28? Uh, yeah, if you can go to 28. Okay. And God blessed them, and he said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So what we see immediately is this, is that... In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, he is speaking to creation. Right. Because man was created the, near, the very next verse in Genesis chapter 
a one verse 27. It says, God created man in the image of God, created he him male and female. He created them. So we see immediately that he is speaking to um, all of creation that has been brought into existence at that point, And he is putting them on notice of the order of things. God right. is a God of order. So the first thing that God is doing, he's letting them know, listen, this is the man, this this one that's coming. So there's no confusion. I want you to uh, I want you to understand his place and role in this economy. That's right. He is going to be a physical representation of myself. Then uh, co-pastor read verse number 28. It sounds as if God repeated himself, but he had to repeat himself for the benefit of the man. Right. That was created in verse number 27. Verse 28, he says, God blessed them and said unto them. Them, who is he talking about? Well, verse number 27, where it says God created them, man in the image of God created he them, male and female. So we see that verse 26, speaking to creation, all of creation, this one that I'm going to bring on the scene, he's a physical representation of me. He as if is he as he is as if I am present myself. Right. So he's gonna be a physical representation. Creates man, verse number 27. Verse 28, since man was not in existence when God made that revelation, mm -hmm. he then tells him, this is who you are. Yes. And this is your job. He says, you're blessed to be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, have dominion over all the earth. Now, what has happened there is what we call the law of dominion. Right. God has now established a law of who has absolute authority over the earth. When he said dominion, if you look the word dominion up, it means sovereign authority over a territory. Right. So now God has now limited what he can do in the earth without the participation of a human being. Mm -hmm. So that's very important. So when you start to, uh, after Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, when you start to look at how God engages the earth, there's a switch or there's a paradigm shift in how he now operates in the earth. I want to show you something in uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse number 19. Now, before co-pastor reads it, what I want you to do is this. I want you to think about Genesis chapter 1, where God is saying in its soul. God is saying in its soul. He's speaking authoritatively in the earth, causing what he wills to happen. Without any limita uh, limitation, without any hindrances, he's speaking. God said in his soul, God said in his soul. All of a sudden, he gets to verse number 27. He creates man. Mm -hmm. Verse number 28, he says, hey, man, now you have dominion over all the earth. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 is a paradigm shift because now God places that spiritual man in his physical body. Mm -hmm. He's now present physically on earth. Now that the man who, has, who he has given sovereign dominion over all the earth is present, watch what God does when it comes down to naming the creatures that he previously had created. He is their creator. He is the almighty. That's right. He is the one who authored all things, but his word has gone for, forth. That's he, right. he now has said, there's somebody on earth that I have given the final say to as it relates to things that take place on the earth. Now, Genesis chapter 2, verse number 19, we'll, we'll recognize God honoring this law, this law of dominion. Okay. In verse 19, it says, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Now, keep in mind, why would God... Now think, now, think about this. He's already created them. Right. He's already formed them. But he stopped short of naming them. Now, we have to recognize God had given man absolute authority over the earth in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 28. Naming is a exercise of absolute authority over whatever's being named. That's right. So this is why parents, when they name their child, they're exercising authority That's over. That's right. That's why when it came down to Jesus, uh, God says, "I'm the Father." That's right. So I'm not going to allow you to name him Joseph Jr. Name him this. When it came down to John the Baptist, whenever somebody yes. had to fulfill a specific yes, role, that's right. God showed up and he says, this is your name. Peter, your your purpose in the earth has changed. You are no longer named uh, uh, Simon, but now your name is Peter. Mm -hmm. Saul, your name is no longer Saul, but your name is Paul. We mean is about destiny. About destiny and exercising authority. So now God has now placed Adam on the earth. 
And he says, now these creatures I have given you dominion over. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 28. Since now you are present and my word has gone forth, I have to allow you to exercise that authority over them because I gave you dominion over them. That's right. So we see this, this shift, this paradigm shift. Now, many of you may be thinking, what does this have to do with the law of reaping? Everything. That's right. If you don't understand this uh, part of the partnership mm -hmm. where there was a shift where God has taken the responsibility of manifestation right. and given it to man. He said, if anything's going to show up or affect this, this natural world, I have delegated that authority to you. That's right. So now we have a revelation that if God's going to do anything in the earth mm -hmm. as it results to anything that will show up or manifest mm -hmm. in the earth, He's going to use a man to do it. That's right. We have to we have to have our minds transformed to come out of a religious way of thinking where we believe God's going to do everything. And and notice uh, what co-pastor said, God's going to do everything. God, God has already done his part. That's right. But there is a part that we play in what God can do for us or with us or through us that we have to recognize. That's right. If we just believe that our part is praying, 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 and we don't believe that there's something in the natural that we have to engage to give God legal access yes. to cause what he can do to manifest in our lives, we will always be frustrated in prayer. That's right. We will always be frustrated in what does manifest in our lives because God is not allowed to do certain things instead of us. Right. He has to do it with us, us and through us. us. Yes. Now, I want to prove this to you. There's, there's a scripture uh, in Exodus chapter 3 mm -hmm. uh, that I want to show you um, this dynamic or this paradigm shift at work. And it's a, very, uh, uh, it's a very familiar passage of scripture that if we do not understand what we just talked about, the law of dominion, mm -hmm. it will seem as if God had changed his mind. But what he's really doing is he's recognizing that there's limitations that I have placed on myself, right. that I'm going to need you to fulfill your partner or, or your your part in partner in bringing to pass my will in the earth. I want to do this. Right. I'm the only one who can do this. Right. But we're in partnership. There's certain things I can't do without your participation. Now, this is the uh, when God met with Moses mm -hmm. at the burning bush and he has a conversation with him. Now, I'm going to start, I'm going to ask co-pastor to start at Exodus chapter uh, 3, verse 7 through 8a, the first part of that verse. And then we're going to look at what God says in verse number 9 and 10. Okay, before we start there, one of the things I think that people have to understand that God is always aware of what is going on in the earth. Sometimes people get upset when they don't see things manifest or don't see God do what they think he should do. He's always aware, but he has to partner with us. That's right. That's right. And, and so, I mean, what co-pastor just, just said is very important for us to, to have balance in yes. what we're talking about, because a lot of people will, will feel because there's something that hasn't happened in their life or hasn't, there hasn't been manifestation that God doesn't care. Right. And that's the farthest thing we're going to find out when we start to look at and give definition of words that before God reveals something to you, he's already done it. That's right. Um, provision. God has already provided mm -hmm. this part that we're talking about right here is why what you have been in need of has not manifested right. a lack of understanding what we're talking about, how to reap what God has already provided. So Exodus chapter three. Uh, okay. Verses seven a, and then a uh, seven, seven to eight uh, through a. eight a, and then verse nine and ten. Okay. After we have a short conversation. Okay, and the Lord said, "I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians." Now. If we look at the text, I hope you have your Bibles open. Look at what God is saying. God has said, I have heard, mm -hmm. I have seen, I have come That's down, right. and I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the, the Egyptians. That's right. Now, from a plain English uh, standpoint, mm -hmm. just common understanding, 
asking you who's going to do the delivering of the people because he has seen, he has heard the cries out to him and he's, and, come, down. And he's come down to deliver them. The obvious answer is God is going to deliver them. That's right. It seems like he he's simply telling Moses, this is what I'm going to do. Right. Now, let's look at verse number 9 and re read verse number 9 and verse number 10. Okay. Verse 9, it says, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, ch the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So looking at what the text just said, God said that he's heard, uh, he has seen, he's come down to deliver them. And so, again, we have this reinforcement almost of, of assuring Moses, I'm going to deliver these people out of bondage. Now, verse number 10, pay close attention to what God says. It says, Come now, therefore, I will send thee unto Pharaoh, and thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I'm, I'm going to ask co-pastor to read that again and emphasize who God says is going to bring them out of Egypt. Okay. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. For those of you who have non-King James Bibles, mm -hmm. he Thank says, you. I'm going to send you, and you're going to bring my people out of Egypt. Wait one minute. Now, God just said mm -hmm. in the previous verses, the two verses, he's almost emphatic. This is what I'm going to do. Right. But then he turns to Moses and he says, but I'm going to send you. That's right. What we have just saw is God recognizing I've turned certain things over in the earth to man. It's my will that they be delivered. Right. It's my will that um, that they be taken out of this bad situation. But I got to find somebody mm -hmm. to do it through. Now, keep this in mind because God's will would have Moses would have said no. Mm -hmm. What if every person that he went to says, no, I can't do it. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm not equipped to go against Egypt. No, I don't have this. I don't have that. They would have spent several more years in bondage right. until God would have found somebody, a human being that he could work through right. to to manifest his will in the earth. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is the law of dominion. What God does understand is he says, listen, there's a partnership there's something that you have to do and there's something right. that I have to do in order for my will to be manifested on the earth. We know that it was God's will mm -hmm. that the children of Israel not be in bondage any longer. That's right. He had told Abraham they're going to be in bondage for 400 years. The 400 years was up. So this is why God showed up. He's mm -hmm. keeping his word. That's right. But look at what he has to do. He has to actually find somebody who is willing, a willing human being. You were talking earlier about how um, if he had to go to different people because people were not willing, what would happen to the children of Israel? And that's the same thing with us. When things happen and we're praying to God about something that we need deliverance for or need manifestation, if there's someone that he runs into who's not willing, it interrupts what he's trying to do because he needs a willing human being. And so go, going back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28, where we saw God said, I give you dominion or sovereign authority over the affairs of the earth. Mm -hmm. What God li li literally did and what we see here is that now he has to partner with the human being. Right in order for his will to manifest on earth. So when God wanted to name the animals, what did he have to do? He says, listen, now that the man is on the earth, I created you, right. I formed you. Man had nothing to do with this. He's a creature. He, he is a creature in the creation himself. Right. However, my word came out of my mouth that said, this man mm -hmm. will have absolute authority over the earth. So from that point on, I have to now reference him. Right. Uh, get him to participate in some form or fashion, yielding his will and his body so that my will can be done in the earth. That's right. And so this is very important for us to recognize because when we're talking about prayer or we're talking about yes. lack or insufficiency That's in right. our lives, God has already provided. It's his will that you prosper, be in health, even as your soul prospers. Yes. So we know that it's his will so that if it's not manifesting, 
It has something to do with then us. it has to has something to do with us, our participation in it. God uh, brings uh, Moses to the mountain. He says, "Listen, Moses, this is what I want to do. Right. This is really what he's saying. I really want to do this, but I need for you to go for me. Mm-hmm. I need your participation in this manifestation right. of my will in the earth." So this is very important for us to remember. This is something that if you don't have this understanding, you could become again very frustrated. And, and and very um, and, and suffer lack unnecessarily because you don't understand the relationship between what God wants to do. Quickly, I want you to turn to uh, Genesis chapter 8, verse number 22, and then we're going to close right here because this is the other law that, that, that um, impacts the law of reaping and harvest, our ability, our understanding of what is necessary for us to reap our harvest. We just saw the law of dominion, which we saw where God says, I'm going to commit uh, the manifestation of the affairs or, or the manifestation of things that take place on the earth. Man has authority over that. But God says, but I'm going to give you confidence in sowing and an expectation of reaping by this law. So Romans, excuse me, um, Genesis. Genesis chapter eight, verse number 22. It says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, Day and night shall not cease. So God says, this is a law. He says, seed, time, and harvest shall not cease. As long as there's cold and heat, day and night, we can have confidence that this law is in effect. So we're going to stop right there. But I want you to look at the scriptures that we've covered so far, meditate on what's been said. And as we move into our next lesson, think about how this applies to your life. Not just we're having a Bible study, but these are laws that govern life in the kingdom. I'm Dr. J.C. Matthews here with Co-Pastor. We'll see you in our next broadcast. God bless you.